Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let's pray together on page 185 as we say, Almighty God, you hear our hearts open, all desires known, and from you the secrets are hidden. Let us the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you. And for the name of God, your holy name, to the Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a moment. I think I spotted one or more younger children invited to come forward to the front for a second. Nice. Good morning. Good morning. Well done. Carrying the cross. And that's maybe a good. Good segue. Um, we're at a time in the church year, right around the end of October, beginning of November, when we tend to remember and give thanks for what we call saints. A saint is a little bit like, I, I know very popular these days are heroes, especially in the movies. Can you name any favorite superheroes? Wonder Woman, <laughs> Superman, awesome, well done, exactly. Now, there might be some ways in which we can uh, think of how superheroes help us to imagine what a saint is. They might be similar in some ways. Now, one way, when I think of a saint, I think of someone who carries the cross and helps me to see Jesus. So that's why it was really helpful you had the cross today. Another way I think of saints is see, especially right there, if you turn to the right, if you look right at it, do you notice you kind of have to shield your eyes? It's very bright. So the window, all those windows on the side, they're different from the rest of the wall. How, how is it different? Does it let something through? That's right, the window lets the light shine through. And so a saint, we often say, is someone that has let the light of God shine through in their lives. Doesn't mean they're perfect all the time, but it means that through their life they let God shine through. So a, window, a, a saint is kind of like a window that lets God shine through. So today, you're going to be making sort of like a window uh, a stained glass sort of window that you can then hang on your window and the light will shine through it. So as, as how about Lane, if you lead the, uh, lead the group downstairs with the cross, we will stand and sing 366. <laughs> Where it is divided, reunited. 
and all for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and looked to the Lord. Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. 
Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Gospel of Christ. Someone from uh, an urban church in downtown London in the UK uh, wrote this reminiscence about a recent uh, experience at church. I heard him swearing at the back of the church. I warned the vergers. He was drunk and really angry. And when the verger approached, it poured out a barrage of vile expletives induced by alcohol and the misery of living on the streets. I went to get ready for the Eucharist, the words still ringing in my ears. And then later at the altar, as I said the words of invitation, draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, and his blood, which was shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. There he was, coming up the aisle. I wondered if I should stop and get help to get him out before he caused another scene. I watched him coming, tottering up the center of the church on unsteady legs. I waited for him to let rip as I stood on the sanctuary step. He knelt at the altar rail, crossed himself and held out his hands. Should I refuse him after that barrage of abuse, I wondered. But as he knelt there, all I noticed was his hands. They were thin, tapering, weathered hands. I could see the sinews of the wrists, the lines on his palms and the creases of his open fingers. I've seen hands like this before, many pictures of hands like, the, like this were nailed to a cross. They were Christ's hands placed Christ's body into those hands, I remembered that when God looks at us, he sees only Jesus. He crossed himself again and walked slowly away. Maybe that's something of a modern-day Zacchaeus type of story. Uh, the story has been described as such, the usual custom when a preacher 2,000 years ago, or a would-be prophet or miracle worker, when they're doing well out on the circuit, uh, the practice is for them to accept an invitation from a local pious dignitary, someone upstanding, a pillar of the meeting house, a bit of a connoisseur of the finer points of the law, who will feed this rising star and re in return get a private performance of whatever the new thing that they're doing as a sort of after-dinner entertainment. But Yeshua, Jesus, keeps ignoring the invitations that he receives and tends to pick the night's host for himself from out of the crowd, again and again unerringly settling on some really unrespectable citizen, someone like a wine shop owner that the pious would usually ignore, or an out-and-out -out public enemy like a tax farmer for the empire. That's how one contemporary commentator describes the scene we heard. Uh, and that's what happened in the reading. Jesus picks the, uh, the person, the host for himself, and says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus picks the host to be from the crowd, picks the unrespectable, picks the type of person that a respectable or just plain ordinary person would grumble about. And grumbling is an understandable human reaction. 
in the story or to injustice or unfairness. About five or six hundred years before this scene, the prophet Habakkuk wrote, The law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous and judgment comes forth perverted. Today we might just say, I'm surrounded by idiots. <laughs> and the crowds were right to grumble about Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector, and the story says a chief tax collector. He was the boss of them, and he was rich. He was rich because he was a tax collector, and he was a tax collector because there was a foreign power that controlled his people's land. And Zacchaeus thought it prudent to side with these invaders, taking money from his people, his community, the people that he'd grown up amongst, eaten with, worshipped with, and worked with, and then pass that money along to the people slowly eroding their freedom. Passing it along, thinking of a modern day example, passing along to the machine gun toting soldiers at the street corners and checkpoints, passing it along to the Germans occupying Paris, passing it along to the lizard skinned aliens colonizing the earth, if you remember that 1980s series V. Some people just want to side with the winners and it seems safer. And so the crowds grumble with good reason. I bet Zacchaeus was used to some grumbling, not that it made it much easier to deal with. Zacchaeus climbs a tree to get a look at this traveling prophet, but isn't that also symbolic of that feeling of distance between himself and well, everyone else? the community in which he was raised. The tree gives him a view, but also kind of shields him, hides him among the branches and leaves. He can keep Jesus and the crowds at a bit of a distance. He's in the good graces of the most powerful military force in the whole world, and he's rich. And yet not everything is right within himself not to mention in his relationships. There's a yearning for reconciliation, again, within himself or with others, and he thinks that Jesus will somehow help with that. And finally, being open, honest, and vulnerable to himself and to God and to others, he's done something rather unusual, childish, and undignified, especially for a very wealthy person, by climbing a tree, and his life changes when Jesus names him and involves and includes him. Now Jesus, we think of him as a champion of the hurting and the oppressed who knew and used anger to overturn tables when necessary. Jesus here, though, doesn't lecture Zacchaeus, doesn't have him sign a form pledging a change in behavior. Nor does Jesus ignore Zacchaeus and keep away lest the reputation of this small chief tax collector rub off on Jesus and affect his standing. Maybe Jesus just sees Zacchaeus and his failings as more obvious than most people's. Maybe Jesus recognizes that the only hope for real, like substantial change, in this lost soul up in the tree is going to have to come from God. And maybe Jesus sees that God must be at work in this scene, because it was God that gave Zacchaeus that inclination to climb the tree like a little kid. Jesus invites Zacchaeus to lunch, invites him into a relationship, as he does to each one of us, and that list of changed behaviors and the making of amends that Zacchaeus ends up spouting out, it comes as the fruit of that encounter. It comes later, not, it's not a prerequisite. The desire for justice and change and for a better Zacchaeus is still very present and real. But Jesus puts this change of life that Zacchaeus needed each one of us needs. It put, puts it in the context 
of relationship with God. With the safety net of love, there to catch us if we fall, and I'm thinking that's relevant for little Zacchaeus up in the tree, we're more likely to take risks, to take that leap of faith and face our fears, to begin to set things right. Sometimes it takes that leap of faith, sometimes it involves taking a chance, and the safety net is our trust in a God that will catch us if we fall. This story, the story kind of similar thematically to the last couple we've heard these past few Sundays, it's a story, we might say, about grace. But that's a very specific, very religious term, and sometimes we either get so used to it, or it becomes an exclusively religious term, and we forget it has to actually do with life. So, looking at this story today, I'd say that Grace has something to do with Jesus wanting Zacchaeus down there back amongst the community that he had alienated and not hiding up in some tree. Recognized, as Jesus would say, as a child of Abraham and Sarah, one of the people. Grace is when people around us grumble in the never-ending contest of comparing and judging, but... Jesus stands up for us and says that he's come to seek out the lost, find the lost sheep, heal the sick, raise the dead. Not just the good and the living and the perfect. Grace is the power of God working inside Zacchaeus, maybe quietly urging him to join the crowd, greeting Jesus, and to get up that tree to take a look. All of this is especially pertinent today, this time of year, when especially our Lutheran friends and other Protestant Christians observe Reformation Sunday, or Reformation Day on October 31st, a day to remember the heroes of the 16th century Reformation era and other eras, people who helped the church to remember the treasure that it carried, but also the reality that that treasure is carried in clay jars that can get a bit dusty or mucked up, tend to accumulate dirt over time that obscures the treasure within. And you probably know something about the famous story of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses or 95 points, 95 issues he had with people in the church, nails them to the door of the big church in town, opposing the corruptions that had come to dominate much of life in that day. And the very first thesis, the very first point, is when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ says repent, Jesus willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Jesus willed the entire life of Christians to be of repentance. Luther goes on to clarify that the sacrament of confession, like a priest declaring forgiveness, um, doesn't quite cut it, nor does some sort of inner feeling that we might come to on our own where we either feel really bad or maybe real good, that doesn't cut it either. Neither of those is full repentance, true repentance. But we see true repentance in Zacchaeus who excitedly tells Jesus that for the rest of his life he's going to do things differently. Luther would explain that repentance is something like having a change of spirit or recovering one's senses. Today we might say it's like coming to your senses. It's repentance. But again, for Luther, it wasn't something that the church could do for you or that your emotions could do for you. It's not something we can do all on our own. Repentance comes from God. It's the working of that grace, that power of God. Repentance is the working of God inside of us bringing us back to our senses. Yes, it's there when Zacchaeus, or we, say that things are going to be different. We're going to do things different from now on. But the grace was there even before that, when Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was going to be walking by, and he said that he wanted to see it. God was working inside him, giving him an awareness of how, as rich as he was, things were not all well in his life. 
And that was the first step in opening himself up to God and opening himself back up to the community. It may have seemed foolish or embarrassing, the richest guy in town struggling up a tree, but that day salvation came to that household. And that is the freedom and newness that's available to everyone. The sometimes difficult awareness that not everything is right in our lives, in our relationships, in our very selves. But the acceptance of that awareness, that coming to our senses, is nothing less than God working inside us. And it's the first step into a renewed and restored life, something that 12-step groups have known for some time. So today in our Eucharist, our communion, maybe focus on that moment after the Lord's Prayer when the bread is broken. Even at the back of the church, you can probably hear the audible cracking of the wafer. Let that be a symbol and a reminder that our salvation comes to us not through riches or strength, but through brokenness. And in that silence, before and after that cracking, and in that cracking, take a moment to explore and to lift up the brokenness that you know. Not everything within and around me and you and your neighbor is all right or at peace. Accept that, accept the brokenness, and celebrate this awareness, this coming to our senses. Because God's power is known in weakness, and that honest awareness is the first step of repentance, of something new, something changed and different. For Jesus came to seek out and to save the lost. They were Christ's hands. I placed Christ's body in those hands. I remembered that when God looks at us, he sees only Jesus. He crossed himself and walked slowly away. Amen. Let's stand together as Abel and turn to page 189 in the book. We recall our baptism as we say together the Apostles' Creed. So together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, the Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Loving God, we cry to you for our broken world. We pray to you for those who seek their own way through violence and threat 
that they may hear your word. The response to hear us, O God, is your mercy is great. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the Worldwide Anglican Communion, we pray for the Anglican Church of Chile, for the Anglican Lutheran Churches in Canada, Bishop Leslie Wheeler Dame and the Laity and Clergy of the Diocese of Yukon, and the President, Faculty, Students, and Staff of the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Saskatoon. In the Council of the North, we pray for the Diocese of Eastern Newfoundland and Labrador. Hear us, O God. In our Diocese of Huron, we pray for St. Jude's in London and St. John's Chapel at Huron University College. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for Danielle Drew. We pray for our clergy, our primate Linda, our bishop Todd, our priest Matt, our honorary assistants Wendy and Jerry, our deacon Kay, and all of their families. Hear us, O oh God. Lord, we pray to you for the people of Ukraine who live precariously in the midst of war and need to mourn and grieve for their many lost people. We pray for the people of Seoul who, who lost too many young people. May they be able to cope and comfort each other and receive your comfort. Give your word to all the leaders of the world. Give them wisdom and the desire to be just and have mercy for their people. Be the refuge and strength of Christians when they are persecuted for their faith. Hear us, O Lord. Embrace all who minister to the sick. Touch and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Danielle, Yvonne and Joe, Sue and Peter, Marilyn, Heather, Iris, Nevin, Rebecca, Cindy, Kathy, Judy, Brandon, Edward, Danielle, Doreen, Al, Shailen, Sharon, David, Lynn, Josh, Melvin, Marilyn, Marika, and junior, and any others that we name silently or aloud. Give them strength to overcome their afflictions. We give you thanks for the lives of our beloved people who have died, especially Barbara Margaret Pope. Let your face shine upon them and give them peace. Comfort and strengthen all who mourn. We pray for our families, friends, companions, fellow parishioners, and all those we love. Hear us, O Lord. In communion with St. Andrew and all the saints, we commend ourselves and each other to you, O Lord. Father, we offer these prayers in the name of your beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us turn to page 191 in the Green Book. Confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done. By what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you. 
from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You're welcome to stand as you can. As Jesus looks up and reaches out to us and says, You, I want you. You have something to do. May we experience true and lasting peace and meaning. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And I'm also with you. Our hymn is going to be 
you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, calling Israel to be your people, and your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, the death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ, and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. In the words our Savior Christ has taught us, we sing together.
stand as able in a moment will be on page 214 of the Greek book. Let us pray. O God, our life, our strength, our food, we give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And together we say, Glory, Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. May the Spirit of God, who is above all and in all and through all, fill you with consciousness of the Lord's presence in earth and the vibrant life of Christ that is within you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you today and forever. Amen. Please be seated for a moment. We do have a few announcements.
John Baxter. I'm one of the wardens here, St. Andrews. And first of all, a greeting and welcome to everybody who's here on this beautiful weather we're having this fall. It's been really nice. Last Sunday, there, there's still items some downstairs left from the fall fair, so if anybody wishes to, wishes to take something away, you can always put, it, put your donation in the offering in another week. And Maureen is still selling real chocolate chocolates downstairs, two for five dollars. Upstairs at the back of the worship space, we want you to know that there's church calendars there that are for, available for six dollars. Also, Thanksgiving envelopes available on the opposite table for anyone wanting to make a special donation in the spirit of Thanksgiving. Regarding upcoming services, note that Next week, we're celebrating the Feast of All Saints, which will include the baptism of Divine Lukov. Then on the 11th, you're welcome to attend morning prayer here at, at the church for Remembrance Day at 9 a.m. And then November 13th, we will conclude our worship service with silent songs and prayers reflecting Remembrance Day. If you would like any departed, remembered in particular, that sort we'll have be able to do that on November the 6th. There's a list to sign up at the back. If you have any medals, photographs, or other items from the wars that you'd like to display, there'll be a table on, at the on the 13th to display them. And lastly but not least, George wanted me to remind everyone of the raking day on November the 12th at 9 a.m. As you can see, we've got lots of leaves up there. The last hymn is 526. <laughs> and now Vivian's coming up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have a chance to put that in. Good morning. My name is Vivian Cudlick. I'm a member of the Social Committee. The Social Committee is bringing back to you the Time and Talent and Treasure option. If you've been thinking about what you would like to donate and have yet to sign up on the sheets that are at the side and back entrances, or sign up on the link provided in the email newsletter, this is your last chance. This week's newsletter, there is a list of donations already received to give you some ideas. Sign up today or contact Kay, Leslie, or myself by Wednesday, November the 2nd for your item to be included. The format will be a little different this year to accommodate COVID protocols. Items for auction will be displayed around the church for three Sundays, November 6th, November 13th, and November 20th. During these three Sundays, we ask you to take time before or after the service to check the items displayed and start your bidding on the sheets provided. On Monday, November 21st, we will review the sheets and determine the lucky persons who have the highest bids, after which we will be contacting these people by email or by phone to arrange payment and pickup. If you're new to the church and have any questions, Kay, Leslie, or I will be happy to answer them. We appreciate your participation, helping to make this a fun and successful event. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. And just a couple of things. There, there is someone who kindly has said that they have some jewelry to... You feel it? Okay, so that's good. Okay, then, then just one thing. As John was saying, we've changed the hymn. It's not the one printed in the leaflet, it's the one on the boards. It's a good reformation hymn, 526, as we go out into the world.